Welcome to uh, what may be the last webinar we ever do again. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and what a great note to, to kind of close on, if, if you like. Um, we have a, a really super talk ahead of us. The thing I just wanted to, to say is that we are super excited about the news that we can reopen on Friday. Um, the whole team met first thing this morning and there's been a, a, just a bevy of activity going on with, with cleaning and preparations uh, and what have you. Um, I will tell you all, uh, we cannot wait to see you physically in the club again. Uh, we are, however, sold out for the weekend. Uh, so Friday, Saturday, and Sunday uh, sold out very quickly, which is super exciting. Um, so if, it's, uh, if we could see you this weekend, super. If not, we look forward to seeing you next week. Um, we do have uh, one more uh meditation tomorrow uh with Rinpoche uh from Bhutan uh, sorry on Thursday and tomorrow of course we have a uh, sorry on Thursday with Rinpoche and on Thursday we have uh, a talk with uh Elaine Kim uh Brian Rogov on uh, the future of education so hope uh all of you interested can join us for that um but for right now uh it's my great pleasure to welcome both James Crabtree Kishwa Mabu Bani. James, uh, no stranger into 1880. He's hosted lots of uh, talks and, and been here before for us. Um, and uh, Kishore will be no stranger to, um, I'm sure, all of you. But I'm going to ask James to introduce Kishore uh, um, and, uh, and take it from there. Thank you. And uh, over to you, James. Very good. Thanks, Mark. Um, delighted to be here introducing potentially the last ever webinar that you're ever going to do. I think we're all um, excited <laughs> to, to come back to the club and to get back to, to normal life. Um, so I'm going to be your chairman for the next hour, maybe a little bit more than that. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Kishore Mabubani. I'm sure Kishore is very familiar to almost all of you, but Singapore's greatest public intellectual, um, I think it, it would be um, fair to say, um, multiply published author, Singaporean diplomat, um, general man about Davos, uh, 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 somebody who has been poking the West with a stick for the best part of three decades through articles and books that have questioned the role of American primacy, uh, and in particular, the role of Asia in that changing world. And so it's with that that we're turning this evening to talk about his new book, which came out a little bit earlier this year, um, which is called Has China Won the Chinese Challenge to American Primacy? Um, and Kishore has such uh, indefatigable energy that despite the fact that um, a pandemic stood in the way of his book's rollout, uh, he has been everywhere. His book's been wide, widely reviewed, um, discussed in all the right places. Um, you'll have seen it mentioned in opinion columns in the FT and foreign affairs and uh, much else besides. So it's as ever a, a controversial book and one that contains some complex advice both for uh, the American and Chinese side of the equation and so it's a great pleasure to have Kishore here on, on home turf to talk to him about it, uh, talk to um, us about that. A, a couple of quick bits of housekeeping. So this session is going to run for an hour. If the discussion at the end is going well, Kishore has said that he might stay for an extra five or 10 minutes. So we'll, we'll see how we go. The way we're going to structure it is I'm going to ask him uh, a few questions to start just to lay out the thesis of the book, um, what the argument is both about America and about China, and then we'll leave the second half, so a full half hour for questions. You can leave questions in the Q&A function on Zoom in the, in the normal way. We're not going to have people give the questions in person, but if you tell us who you are and where you're coming from, then I'll read the questions out and put them to Kishore and get through as many of them as I can. Um, and, and so I hope that will, that will work nicely. Um, so that's it, welcome Kishore. Do you want to give everybody a wave? You'll see a copy of the book in question uh, to the, to, on Kishore's right shoulder on our left as we're looking at it. He's a masterful promoter. Um, and I know that some of you in the audience uh, were recipients of a, of a copy of the, the book via Mark. So I know that at least some of you will have read it, which is terrific. So Kishore, let's dive straight in. Um, in the conclusion of the book, you, you say that geopolitical tensions between the US and China are both inevitable and avoidable. Um, you call this a paradoxical conclusion. So I wonder, by way of just giving a sense for those who haven't yet had a chance to read the book about the general thesis, if you could explain what you mean by that. 
thank you. By the way, thank you very much, uh, James, uh, for the crab tree. But for James, for that wonderful, uh, excellent uh, introduction. But for the record, let me say that uh, as authors go, uh, you have set the standard, and the rest of us are trying to follow because you've got this wonderful hat trick. Uh, of reviews in the Financial Times, Economist, and New York Times, uh, I think in one week, if I remember correctly. And I haven't yet got to that level yet, so I'm still aspiring to get to your level, James, <laughs> in terms of uh, uh, book reviews. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm delighted, uh, and I want to thank Mark for arranging this occasion and for having this opportunity uh, to discuss. I'm very happy that this is the last webinar. I look forward to seeing people in per person uh, again. Now on the thesis, uh, inevitable and avoidable, you're right, it's uh, paradoxical. And it's inevitable because it's driven by very deep uh, structural forces. Uh, and, and let me just mention a few. First, of course, is the fact that uh, for almost thousands of years, whenever the world's number one emerging power uh, which today is China, is about to overtake the world's number one power, today is the United States. That's at the moment when they're passing is when you get maximum geopolitical tension. No number one power seats its position to a number two power uh, in a relaxed fashion. And so it's, the reaction of the United States is perfectly natural. And actually, Graham Allison is the one who's spoken about this uh, in his book, Destined for War. And uh, I agree with this broad thesis that that's a fundamental reason for the problem between the US and China. Although I don't agree with this uh, conclusion, which is reflected in the title of this book. Uh, this book is called Destined for War, and uh, in which he says war is more likely than not between US and China. Uh, I don't think there'll be a hot war between US and China because in a nuclear war, you don't get a winner and loser. You get a loser and a loser. So that, I think, is one thing we can rule out but the rising tension will be there. The second structural factor is that, of course, this is the first time in, I guess, several hundred years that a non-Western power uh, is emerging uh, to be the number one power. And that obviously creates a lot of discomfort. And, and one of the very sensitive subjects that I bring up in the book that I think very few in the West are prepared to talk about, uh, which is that in the uh, Western psyche for several centuries now, there's always been a fear of the yellow peril, uh, and that's real. I mean, it, it, it surfaced in American history before, because at the end of the 19th century, there was something called the Chinese Racial Exclusion Act that was passed. Uh, so that's an indication that the yellow peril is also one other factor that is influencing. And it also explains why the reactions of US to China now are so emotional. Uh, they're almost as though they are very unrestrained in the way they're reacting to China instead of reacting in a very calm, uh, dispassionate manner. And of course, the third structural uh, force that's driving this uh, US-China contest is a very deep disappointment uh, on the part of the American establishment that in their, all the, to all the process of engagement uh, with uh, uh, China, they were hoping that it, it, as America opened up China economically, then subsequently China would open up politically, China would become a democracy, and democracies would live in peace with each other, and they would live happily ever after. Uh, it's very strange that there was this belief, because when a future historian looks at this belief, they, they'll be very puzzled that this young republic, United States, which is less than 250 years old, uh, from inception to now, thinks that if it engages a 4,000-year civilization like China, this young republic would change the 4,000-year civilization rather than the 4,000-year civilization change the 250-year republic. So that, that's a larger historical perspective that is completely missing uh, in the uh, American uh, attitudes towards China. But you can see that there are all these various structural forces at play that are driving these two countries towards a head-on collision. But as I say, as you rightly said, I also say that this is avoidable because at the end of the day, there are many common global challenges. I mentioned global warming in the book, but frankly, the case is put much more strongly by COVID-19 because, in fact, the, if you follow one of the oldest rules of geopolitics, 
the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And since COVID-19 is an enemy of the United States and COVID-19 is an enemy of China, China and the US should actually come together, even if only temporarily to fight against COVID-19. The fact that they cannot even come together to fight against a common enemy shows how deep and strong this geopolitical contest has become between the US and China. So I hope that explains why it is both inevitable and avoidable. Right. My apologies for that. I muted myself and now I'm unmuted. That's an amateur error. Let's start with the US and, and in a sense, we'll wind our way back towards Asia. So a number of our audience here this evening at 1880 will be from North America. I, I mean, you have some quite, um, sort of harsh words to say about the state of the US in all sorts of different ways. Um, but maybe in order to give a sense of that, I mean, can you explain why it is that you think that the, the US is you use the phrase emotional. Um, and I don't know whether this refers merely to Trump or to kind of at a broader level, but, but why is it that you think the, the US has this um, emotional trigger uh, with, with China? What, what, what is it that's going on there? Say a little bit more about the, the fear of the yellow peril. Well, uh, I think the emotional dimension comes from the yellow peril, but also I think comes from the fact that the United States uh, today is also a very deeply uh, troubled society. You know, uh, as you know, it's, it's it's also a very deeply divided society. I mean, that's a reality. But more than that, I think what the the when my American friends read the book, and, and I, I'm here, I'm talking about very very thoughtful senior establishment American friends. Uh, they, they, they've served in the highest uh, positions. And they, they, they told me that what they really appreciated about my book was that they could see I was trying my best to help America out by pointing out to America that you know one of the oldest uh, pieces of strategic advice is before you start a contest, as soon as they no thine self, no thine self, no thine enemy, fight a thousand battles, win a thousand battles. And the critical part that is missing in the uh, American uh, uh, analysis is to know thine self, to know, to know itself. And, and America has basically accumulated some very, very serious structural problems in, uh, in its society. Uh, very profound ones. Uh, and of course, the one statistic I give all the time is that America is the only major developed society where the average income of the bottom 50, five zero percent has gone down over a 30 year period. And, and our colleague, as you know, uh, James Danny Kwa, the dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School, has documented uh, and provided the data for that. And all this has created what uh, two Princeton University economists, Case and Deaton, call a sea of despair among the white working classes uh, in the United States. And there's a lot of uh, social dysfunctional dimensions of American society. So you have basically a huge bed of unrest that's broiling uh, American society that has not been looked at. And, and it, it's sad it's not looked at because at the, when George Kennan advised the United States, uh, Give, give, give the U.S. strategic advice on how to handle the then smaller challenger, the Soviet Union. George Kennan said, at the end of the day, the success of our struggle against the Soviet Union is not going to be, it's not going to be the result of the army guns, army bombs we have. It's going to depend on the domestic vitality of our society. If any, we can produce a more vital, vibrant society than the Soviet Union, we will win. And paradoxically today, if you compare US and China objectively in terms of socioeconomic indicators, in the same 30 year period in which the um, uh, average, 50, uh, average income or the bottom 50% had gone down in, uh, in America, the, the, the last 40 years uh, have been the best 40 years in 4,000 years for the Chinese people. So it's, a, it's an amazing contrast and this, this important 
uh, dimension is just not understood by many Americans who don't understand how far uh, the U.S. is going behind. And of course, what beyond that, of course, there are also larger uh, structural questions as to why has this happened? And one thing that uh, one of your former colleagues uh, in the Financial Times completely agrees with me, in fact, he said so himself, Martin Wolf, that the U.S. has become a plutocracy. And as you know, I emphasize uh, in the book that, you know, Americans see this contest with the US, U.S. and China as one within a dynamic democracy, which is the United States, and then a communist uh, dictatorship, which is China. But if you dig deeper down, United States democracy has become a plutocracy, and the uh, Communist Party dictatorship has become a meritocracy. So I see, as you know, I say at the conclusion of one of the chapter, the conclusion is between a meritocracy and a plutocracy, a meritocracy has, a, has an advantage over a plutocracy. Now, this is, these are sort of larger structural issues uh, in the US-China relationship that are, not, that are not surfacing in the American discourse, which I try to help out. And it also explains why the United States, as you said, is, is getting very emotional because they just don't understand how is it a communist party system is supposed to underperform relative to the United States and frankly, has in many dimensions, has now been doing better than the U.S. over the last 20, 30 years. And there are structural reasons for that. And the structural reasons need to be surfaced and discussed, which is what I think my book is trying to do, and which is what my many, many, of, my, my, many of my American friends appreciate about the, the book. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the more, um, you have a, a, a good way with one-liners, and one of the best in the book is that America, is something to the effect of America is hoping to have a rerun of the Cold War, and it hasn't yet realized that it's going to end up playing the role of the Soviet Union, and China is going to play the role of the US. Um, I, I wonder, could you go back in a sense, though, to this, the Cold War analogy? So you, you, you say right at the beginning, America doesn't have a strategy for dealing with China, and you go back to George um, Kennan's famous article in Foreign Affairs, the, the X uh, memo, when he laid out the original strategy of containment um, of the Soviet Union just after the Second World War, and you say America now has nothing as clear-eyed as that um, in terms of how it's trying to deal with China. So before we get on to China itself, um, what in a sense do you think America should be doing? You're quite critical of what they are doing, but what what is a sensible U.S. strategy to cope with a rise in China in this part of the world? Well, uh, actually, the, ins the, the, the I, as you know, I give credit to one man uh, for the insight that America doesn't have a long-term, serious, comprehensive long-term strategy to deal with China. And that man is, of course, uh, America's greatest living strategic thinker, who's uh, Henry Kissinger. I had a one-on-one -on -one lunch with him uh, at his private club, not 1880. <laughs> Uh, in New York, I think it's called the Brook, I think, and it was in a private room that he gets. Uh, and, and what was amazing about the day was that it was March, but it was going to be a day of heavy snow. And I was so frightened that this 95-year-old man couldn't come through the heavy snow, but he came. I was impressed. He came and he came for the lunch. We had a two-hour one-on-one lunch. And at the end of the lunch, I was trying to figure out what's the big message that uh, Henry Kissinger was trying to give me. And I'm I figured out what he's trying to say. The problem is that we don't have a strategy. So I wrote, I wrote to him and I got his permission, as you know, to put that paragraph, quoting him uh, uh, in that book. And so if, if America were to work out a serious, comprehensive, long-term strategy to deal with China, it would do exactly what I suggested uh, earlier. Know thine self, know thine enemy, fight a thousand battles, win a thousand battles. So America needs to do a very comprehensive, evaluation of its relative strengths and weaknesses vis-a-vis -vis China. And I must emphasize this point. As you know, I begin the book uh, with a fictional memo that uh, is written to President Xi Jinping by one of his colleagues. And the colleague tells President Xi, you know, President Xi, we're take, undertaking a great struggle against the United States. We will, of course, win. But whatever we do, we must never underestimate the United States because the United States is a remarkably strong country. It is the most successful society human, so that, uh, that humanity has produced since human history began. So, you know, this is, the United States is a formidable country and we must understand that it has got formidable strengths. And I must emphasize the strengths still remain in the United States. But at the same time, 
while the strengths remain in the United States, the United States also developed some very serious uh, internal weaknesses, which I spoke about earlier, and it's got to address uh, these uh, internal weaknesses. And, and, and therefore, the, for example, to give you a concrete example of what the United States uh, should do in, in, in terms of its global strategy, Number one, as, as Kennan said, is not going to be decided by guns and bombs. So forget the guns and bombs. Focus on making our society strong. But you know, one thing I say in the book is that it, it, America has had brilliant defense secretaries, Mattis, uh, Ash, and all that. But they cannot, they cannot change the American defense budget. It's not decided by the defense secretary. It's decided by all the defense lobbies who each have, each have their share of the pie. And therefore, the defense, the defense budget is cooked up uh, by all these lobbies. And the American Defense Secretary can't do anything about it. And similarly, if, 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 the, if, the, if, if the United States decided thinking strategically, okay, China is my number one competitor. And so I got to, got to basically focus on my primary contradiction and walk away from my secondary contradictions. The first thing the United States should do is stop fighting wars in the Middle East. I mean, the United States has spent $5 trillion fighting the post 9-11 wars. If that $5 trillion had been given to every member of the bottom 50% of American society that hasn't seen any improvement in the standard of living, each, of the, each person would get a check for $30,000, more than what the Singapore government is giving you with $600 as they gave me. That's an incredible check to get uh, from the US government. But instead, the U.S. has burned $5 trillion fighting unnecessary wars. And as I say quite categorically in the book, every war the United States fights in the Middle East is a geopolitical gift to China. So there are actually some very easy things to be done in theory. But the easy things to do, cut your defense budget, stop fighting wars in the Middle East, U.S. cannot turn around and do. And that explains the, the problem about the strategy of the United States that commonsensical things he could be doing and it's not doing. And of course, the one, uh, one important one I would emphasize, which I think Mark mentioned earlier, uh, which is that frankly, diplomacy is far more important in the game today than your aircraft carriers. And, and, and as Tim Colton, a Harvard professor told me, these uh, billion dollar aircraft carriers can now be brought down by a $100,000 hypersonic missile. So, they, these are not where the, the real struggle is going to be. And, and, and the tragedy here is that, and for someone who's worked with American diplomats for almost 50 years, the State Department has never been so demoralized. So you ask me what are the things America should be doing? Number one, cut your defense budget, stop fighting unnecessary wars, focus on diplomacy. Three easy things, but they cannot be done. Let's turn to China um, before we open it up for, for questions. So. You're, you're very good in the books, as always, at sort of um, kind of poking uh, Western analysts. But I, the, the kind of Western response to the book in a number of the reviews has been, OK, you know, Kishore reads some home truths about the United States, but actually doesn't do the same to China. And, and so in the book, you're, I don't know how you would describe it, but, but sort of moderately admiring. You describe China as a meritocracy. You say that, you know, you, you have nice things to say about Xi Jinping. In the aftermath of COVID-19, there's been a lot of talk in the West and in countries like Japan and India that China is becoming more assertive again. Um, Taiwan, Hong Kong, in the Himalayas, even today we have, we have trouble in the, the Himalayas in various other domains as well. What, what, what's your view on that? Um, mm -hmm. do, you, do you agree with this view that in a sense that China is increasingly becoming assertive and this is creating problems, not just for the US, for its neighbor, but, but also for its neighbors. And, and if not, why not? What are we getting wrong in the way that we understand China's behavior? Mm. Well, you're, you're absolutely right that uh, uh, my book is much more positive on China than anything you would find in, in much of the Anglo-Saxon literature. But, that, but that's, if you look at the overall picture, if you look at the hundred books that are coming out, okay, on China, I assure you that 99 of them are negative on China and one, one me is trying to be positive. Yes, the book itself is more positive on China. But if you look at the overall balance of books, go to any bookstore, go to Kinokinia, look for books on China 
and find me something that is, is, is reasonably balanced and positive on China, you can't find. So that, in the, it's, in the, it's in that larger overall context that I'm trying to rectify the balance and say, think again about China. You, you've got all this negative stuff. And, you know, for example, as you know, I tell the story about uh, how well-known myths about China get repeated. Uh, it is, for example, said uh, by in every Anglo-Saxon newspaper, it said, President Xi Jinping reneged on his promise not to demilitarize in the South China Sea. But as the former U.S. ambassador to China, Stapleton Roy told me, yes, Xi Jinping offered to President Obama not to demilitarize the South China Sea. Stapleton Roy told me, Kishore, we should have seized that offer. Instead, he said, we send the U.S. Navy in. And you send the U.S. Navy in, the Xi Jinping said, okay, you reject my offer? Our militarists. So, I mean, that's an example of a story that is just not told anywhere uh, in the uh, Anglo-Saxon media. So that's how my book tries to uh, balance it out. But, I, I, but China obviously is not a perfect society. China obviously has got lots of uh, 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 challenges. And, and the paradox here is that actually the Chinese want to concentrate on their internal challenges. They don't want to go and fight wars in the Middle East. They actually want to take care of their own society and continue development. Because as they say, they're still only, uh, their per capita income is only still 10,000 compared to 60,000 uh, of the United States. So they have a long way to go uh, uh, to catch up. But if you, if, you, if you ask me, for example, what are the things that uh, they should consider? Uh, uh, you know, as you know, I, 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 I say in the book, if you want to figure out what exactly is the number one challenge that China faces, it's very, very clear. Uh, how does China transform its political system to deal with a new society that is emerging, which where China is going to have, in fact, by now I suspect China already has, but very soon for sure will have the world's largest middle class society. When you have the world's largest middle class society, are you still going to carry on ruling it the same way uh, with the same kind of communist party system. And, and as you know, changing a political system is really very, very difficult, very difficult. And so this is the number one challenge that the Chinese face internally. And I think they want to focus on their internal challenges. And that's why the Chinese actually have not fought a war in 40 years. They are the only permanent member of the UN Security Council that hasn't fought a war in uh, 40 years. And actually until today, just until today, had not fired a bullet in 30 years. But today, uh, I just heard, as I'm sure you've heard, some shots have been fired uh, between Indian and Chinese forces, which of course is very alarming. And uh, so that, that's an indication of how, relatively speaking, strategically restrained they have been. And I think they will try to be restrained, but at the same time, I must also emphasize that when a new great power emerges, which is what China is happening with China, of course it's going to become more assertive. I mean, that's natural superpower behavior. In fact, it's much more natural for superpower not to be assertive, but to be aggressive. And in fact, Graham Allison says in his book, you know, he says, you know, I, you, Americans keep wishing that China would be like America. Graham Allison says, wait, 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 wait. Think twice, you know, because when America was emerging at the same time when China was emerging around 1900, you had Teddy Roosevelt. He declared wars on Spain. He seized the Philippines. He seized uh, uh, Guam. And, you know, uh, so he, he started all kinds of wars. And that, that's what, that's what super, emerging superpowers do. And that's why it's actually quite remarkable, touch wood, so far, China hasn't done that. So let, let's, let's give credit where it is due. But I agree with you that when, as China becomes more and more powerful, it is going to become more assertive and we've got to learn to deal with a new superpower in our neighborhood. Very good. Okay, now, so we've got a whole bunch of questions. Um, if possible, leave your questions in the chat function as opposed to the Q&A, but um, don't worry, those of you who have uh, put your questions in the q and I'll get to as many of them as we can. So we haven't talked about um, home turf, and so I have a question here from William Cornwell, Bill Cornwell. How can Singapore become a contributing factor in improving China-U.S. relations? And I, I wondered, I mean, I was going to ask about this. The Singapore's Prime Minister Lee just wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs, in a sense, where he made a, a plea for 
engagement and cooperation, I think you'd say, that, that in a sense the US and China have to work together, mm -hmm. um, which against the backdrop of prevailing public opinion in the West, which is trending sharply anti-China, this, um, in a sense, uh, it seems like he was trying to have a conversation with the West in particular to try and persuade the Western audiences not to go off the deep end. But I wonder if you have anything to, to sort of say about that um, and also to answer Bill's question about Singapore and ASEAN and the, the role that we that is to be played in this part of the world. Well, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad you referred to the uh, uh, article by PM in the magazine Foreign Affairs. Uh, uh, I would say it's a very brave uh, article and so too was his speech at the uh, Shangri-La Dialogue. But I think uh, when, the, when the Prime Minister wrote that article, he wasn't just speaking on behalf of Singapore. Uh, I think he was speaking on behalf of a lot of people around the world. And as you know, I devote a whole chapter of the book uh, towards what the, what, what the rest of the world uh, would like to see in the US-China conflict. And the thesis in my cha that chapter of mine is that there are 330 million people living in America, 1.4 billion people living in China, but that still leaves 6 billion people outside the US and China. And most of the 6 billion people actually want to focus on their own countries, on their own country's development, and really don't want to get involved in a new major geopolitical contest with uh, China. Because it, it is a major distraction while they want to focus uh, 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 on everything else. So I suspect if we did a poll of most of the countries, it is, by the way, I want to emphasize, of course, every, many countries in this region want the United States to stay in this region. They don't want the United States to leave the region. But they also want a more thoughtful and considered United States that is actually learns to work with it. Uh, region rather than trying to make demands uh, on the region saying don't do X, don't do Y because uh, and, and, and I must emphasize that during the Cold War Singapore worked very very closely uh, with the United States in the Cold War I, when I was ambassador to the UN from 84 to 89 uh, paradoxically the ASEAN delegations, the United States delegation, the Chinese delegation worked very very closely together on the Cambodian issue and there was a lot of diplomatic sensitivity on the part of American diplomacy. You know, can you imagine a Secretary of State like George Shultz who would listen very carefully and very intently to what he was saying, and then try to adapt what he was doing? Uh, and, and today, that doesn't happen in American diplomacy. You know, it doesn't happen. American just says, "Don't do X, don't do Y," and so everybody's wondering, "Why? Why? Why are you doing this?" So, so the net result uh, of all that, of course, is that. Uh, it is not shown, but every time the United States tries to block a major Chinese initiative, sadly, it, 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 is, it is failing. I mean, it, it launched a campaign even under President Obama to stop countries from joining the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And then key American allies like UK, France and Germany joined the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Then it's tried to stop countries from joining the Belt and Road Initiative and lo and behold, out of 193 countries in the world, I think 120 countries have signed up for the Belt and Road Initiative. So clearly, the, 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 uh, you can see very clearly that most countries in the world want to have good relations with the United States, want to have good relations with China, and don't want to be forced to choose. Um, so here's a good question, which, uh, so Kai Ang, given you were talking about US diplomacy and George Kennan, um, in a recent New York Times op-ed, Thomas Friedman described Mike Pompeo as the worst ever Secretary of State that America has had. Now, I know you're a diplomat, and so you're good at wriggling out of these questions, but uh, do you agree with him, and if so, why? Uh, well, I would say my knowledge of American history is not as good as Tom Friedman. He took classes in American history uh, in high school in Minneapolis, and I never took any courses in American history. So I will defer to his judgment on who's been the worst uh, uh, Secretary of State, because honestly, I can't even name uh, many of them uh, myself. Right, and take it in a less controversial, what do you make of Pompeo as a, I mean, in a sense, you, you, were, you were saying implicitly in your last answer that, you know, the previous eras of American diplomacy would have been uh, more astute in the way that they dealt with China and that there's something uh, rather blunt about the way that Trump and his team are dealing with it. So say a little bit more about that. Well, I, I, I would say that 
you know what happens in this in this dialogue so is that we focus on personalities so i mean you can for example focus on president trump as a personality you can focus on pompeo as a personality but i think the issue is not personalities the issue is the larger overall question about strategy and this is what i think henry kissinger focused most uh, in his two hour lunch with me and by the way i also recommend his book on china it's, it's called on china uh, it's a very good book and then he talks about how the united the, how china plays the game of go while the united states is playing or west is playing a game of chess and how the Chinese are patiently accumulating assets decade by decade. So you can see some kind of comprehensive long-term strategy that the Chinese are working towards. But I don't see any kind of similar uh, strategy on the part of the, uh, of the United States. So it, it, let's not focus on the personalities. It could be Mr. Y who replaces uh, Secretary Pompeo. But if he, even if he's a much nicer guy and doesn't hurl insults at countries, but if he doesn't have a strategy, the problem remains. It's not the person. Very good. Um, you mentioned earlier the, the, the events of the day. So since we're right up to date, and since I know that you're about to go on Indian television after this to talk about the events of the day, I have a question here from, uh, from Karun uh, Kariapa, um, who said, given the recent hostilities with India, uh, which we all hope will be am amicably, amicably resolved, do you think China is prepared to assert its growing power by risking a war, or even a limited one, with India? Well, I hope not. Uh, I hope not. I guess I think any kind of war, even a limited war, would be disastrous uh, for both uh, China and India. And I'm actually, to be honest with you, quite shocked to hear that there was loss of life today. Because until now, I thought that the... Chinese and uh, Indian soldiers, uh, because they come from well-established militaries, are very disciplined. And in fact, I understand that in the last uh, crisis in Doklam, uh, as you know, near Bhutan, the Indian and Chinese soldiers stood, I was told, one foot apart from each other and glared at each other, but didn't touch each other. Now, that took a tremendous amount of strategic discipline. That shows me what happens when you have two very disciplined militaries uh, facing off each other. But something obviously went wrong today. And, and, I, and I would say that we have to wait for the facts to emerge. But the, my broad point that I've been, I've, been, I've been on Indian television a few times now, the key point I make to an Indian audience is that India today is in a geopolitical sweet spot. Because if you can imagine a seesaw with the United States on one side and China on the other side, if India balanced itself in the middle of the seesaw, it could determine which way the seesaw would go. And, and then India will be the most heavily cotton power in the world. In fact, India has been the most uh, heavily courted power in the world. So the question is whether United, whether China, whether you, China, India can continue to position itself in the middle. That's the critical thing. And, and I'm, I'm not so sure uh, whether India is trying to do that. There, there, as you know, there's a, some, you get very confusing signals from India. And that's what I hope to find out also uh, from the TV program uh, that are beyond in an hour or plus. There we go. You're a busy man at the moment. Um, question from Frank Trois, so the American side of the house. He said, um, I enjoyed the book and I enjoyed reading the irony you highlighted that US hawks want China to fail, yet the US has an expectation that China should implement democracy and to become a market society. Whereas in fact, if the US really wanted China to fail, it should in a sense leave it be and, and let it continue on a path to to, to Leninist autocracy. Um, and so Frank asks, can you sort of tease that out a little bit as to why you think um, the US has this seemingly contradictory view on what it wants China to do? Yeah, that's, I must say that's a great question. And that, that's what I actually try to hint to in my book about the incoherence uh, of American policy uh, towards China. Because if America believes that communist party is if America believes 
that its primary objective is to remain number one, then the best way it can remain number one is to allow China to uh, continue with a system that is designed to fail, which is a communist party system. So instead, if America wants to remain number one, it should tell China, please don't become a democracy. Because if you became a democracy, you will become as strong as the United States of America. Please remain in a communist party state. And that would be a very logical thing. Uh, the United States would say to China, and the Chinese would agree right away and say, yes, 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 we'll remain a communist party state. Okay, let's shake hands and settle that issue. But of course, the, the, the bizarre contradiction in American strategic thinking, and sometimes I say uh, a bit harshly that the term American strategic thinking is becoming an oxymoron uh, because uh, the, America wants to remain number one and then wants to make China a democracy. Now, excuse me, if you want to make China a democracy and China become more successful, you become number two. Are you ready for that? So this, 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 there is, uh, as a question to put it very well, there's this fundamental contradiction there in, in American thinking. And, and at the end of the day, there's also a deeper question down there because America hasn't quite defined what its strategic priorities are. You know, is, is the strategic priority, I mean, I can, I can give you at least three different strategic priorities which are equally important. And, but you've got to choose, you've got to choose one of them. Is your strategic priority primacy, right? If it's primacy, then okay, then you go all out to undermine China and bring it down. But if your strategic priority is the well-being of your people to improve their livelihoods, then you may want to work with China to strengthen your, your economy because you can get economic growth through the Chinese market. And then another strategic priority is, do you really want to promote your values are your values more important than your interests? And as you know, the United States gives completely con contradictory answers. In some countries, it insists you must be a democracy. In the case like Saudi Arabia, it says, okay, now that Saudi Arabia, please don't become a democracy. They, were, they want Saudi Arabia to remain as it is. So there, there, are, there are these various contradictions in, in American policies that I think should be resolved through more open, honest debate inside the government about what should be the real priority uh, of the uh, United States. And actually, my, my advice to the United States is focus on the well-being of your people. Please stop seeing this slide in the uh, incomes of the bottom 50%. Raise up your bottom 50%. That will make you a stronger society. That will make you once again a shining city on the hill. And then you'll remain number one. If not necessarily a number one economy, you'll remain the number one most admired society in the world which is what America should be aspiring to become. But you are, to push you a little bit on this, you, your basic view, I, I got the sense coming through, was that, in a sense, America is most likely to become number two, certainly economically and on other measures. And in a sense, it, it really just needs to get used to that, that, that it, this idea that, that America must remain number one is ultimately going to turn out to be the wrong path and, and that there getting getting used to this almost inevitable relative decline is something that would be in America's long-term interest. Am, am I reading you right on that? Uh, yes, I think you are. Uh, and I think uh, the, the one thing, you know, the, 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 you know I, 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 I basically live in the U.S. for 15 years, I guess, altogether. And the strange thing about American society is that uh, is, is the freest country in the world. You can say anything you want, oh, by far, no, no question whatsoever. But if you are a politician in the United States of America and you just state what may be an obvious, possible, even likely fact and say, my fellow Americans, well, let's prepare for the day when we're going to become number two, right? <laughs> you are absolute toast in America absolute toast. No serving American politician can, can utter the words, let's prepare for being number two. And that's a crazy contradiction. And as you know, the only man who once, only once, <laughs> bravely tried to prepare Americans for that was Bill Clinton in a speech he gave in Yale in 2003. And I quoted that speech in my previous book. 
uh, the great convergence where he said, if America is going to be number one forever, let's keep on doing whatever you're doing, get it apart. We can conceive a world where no longer number one, then we should be strengthening multilateral institutions, processes, rules, and so on and so forth. He only said it once, but never repeated it again because it's suicide <laughs> to talk about that. And, and, and so that, that I, I highlight that fact because the, there is a, the, the United States, many in the United States are not aware that the amount of power that the United States had relative to the rest of the world, especially after World War II, when, and it's after World War II, when the United States had 5% of the world's population with 50% of the world's GNP, it was obviously abnormal. But Americans got used to so much power. And to be fair, initially when America was so powerful, it was very generous with its power and actually exercised it very wisely and created great global institutions that allowed the world to flourish. In fact, paradoxically, when America was really, really powerful, it was, it was generous, magnanimous uh, to its former enemies, Japan, Germany, and so on and so forth. So, but the Americans cannot conceive of a world where America no longer enjoys that amount of relative power vis-a-vis -vis the, the rest of the world. And what's happening to America is not, nothing that is surprising. America is becoming a normal country. So if you have 5% of the world's population, as uh, the US does, maybe you, will not, you, will, you won't have 50% of the world's GNP. Today it has about 25%. You'll go down to maybe 10 to 15%. But that's okay. American people can be very, very wealthy. But your share, relative share of global power is obviously going to diminish. Then why don't you talk about it and talk about how you, how you protect American influence and American ability to influence the world in a world where your share, relative share of power has gone down. But that's the kind of questions that no American politician can say or discuss publicly, which is actually quite shocking. Uh, so let me, I, I was going to, I'm, I'm going to ask in a minute about the, the tech war, but um, since we're on the US, uh, we had a, a couple of questions about, um, about the election, which is the obvious thing I think to, to ask about. So uh, there was one question basically saying, if Trump wins, what does that mean for China policy and multilateralism? Um, and what about uh, what about if Biden wins? What what's your sort of outlook over recent, really over the last week? I think a sense has taken hold that Trump, having been a runaway favorite to win before COVID, is now really up against it, and so people are looking very seriously at Biden and what he would mean. But let's start with Trump. What happens if Trump wins with the China relationship? Yeah, actually, the the, the more interesting question you do ask is uh, in their heart of hearts. Uh, do the Chinese want Trump to win or do they want Biden to win? Very good. So what's the answer? <laughs> I, 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 I don't know the answer to the question. <laughs> but I sense that the Chinese are deeply, deeply conflicted because there is no question whatsoever that President Trump has caused more aggravation for the Chinese than any recent American president has. No question, especially the trade war, the erratic moves and the attack on Huawei. And I think what, what most people and the rest of the what most Americans are not aware of, what is most galling is the arrest of the daughter of the founder of Huawei. Because that basically reminds the Chinese of the century of humiliation. We Chinese can be kicked around again by the Western power. And the Chinese saying, no, this cannot happen again. So that actually, frankly, is the most galling thing that Trump has done. So you can see why they would be happy to be rid of him. But on the other hand, no American president has done as much as President Trump has to lower America's standing, st standing stature, prestige in the world, and basically, he has shrunk the amount of geopolitical space that America enjoyed in the world. And the more he shrinks America, uh, America's geopolitical space, the more geopolitical space he creates for China. 
So four more years of Trump, my God, uh, basically Trump is going to destroy uh, America's standing in the world and therefore he'd be a gift. But at the same time, I also suspect that the, the, the Chinese must also be exhausted uh, in trying to deal with the Trump administration and maybe would like a bit of relief. There's absolutely no doubt that Joe Biden will be far more courteous, far more polite, no more insults. Uh, to China uh, than the way that Trump did. But at the same time, the United States under Biden would be a far more formidable uh, competitor of uh, China because the, all the allies will come back. All the Europeans and others who were vaccinating, hesitating, will now come back to the United States. So it's a different uh, world. So trying to figure out Chinese calculations, Trump or Biden, is a very interesting exercise. And it's hard to say at the end of the day, uh, what their choice will be, but they also know that the choice will not be theirs. But they say, okay, whoever wins, we will deal with it. And we will always play a long game. He'll be there four years. We've been around 4,000 years. It's okay. Let me, um, let me ask, I have a question from Sushan Tan, um, which is about the, the, the tech war. So you mentioned Huawei, which is always a hot button issue in US-China relations, but there's a, a wider um, digital confrontation, which wasn't true in the previous Cold War, if we think this is in some ways a, a kind of rerun of the Cold War. So what's your view of that? Sushan asks in particular about the role of the dollar, of 5G, um, and China's attempt to create um, an electronic version of the RMB. But, but in general, how do you see this digital contest playing out as a, as a kind of facet in this, this tension between the two superpowers? Well, uh, let me thank Sushan, as usual, for asking the most difficult question. <laughs> uh, it is actually the technology dimension that, to be honest with you, uh, I know the least about. But I also know that it is probably going to be the most critical dimension of the U.S.-China contest. And of course, when future historians try to figure out, you know, as you know, for a long time, and when China was rising in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, especially 2000s, what was the most explosive decade of Chinese economic growth? <laughs> the United States was busy fighting wars in Iraq, and the United States was distracted, and China kept growing. But sometime, at some point in time, over the last three to four years or whatever it is, even before Trump, the uh, United States woke up and realized, oh my God, we now have some, a very powerful competitor. And I think it was that technological dimension where the United States assumed that you would always be far ahead of everybody else. They suddenly found that the gap was narrowing. And especially, I think, when the, uh, China announced its uh, Made in China 20, uh, 2025 program, yeah. that, that was a real, real wake-up call for the American establishment. Because then they understood that China's ambitions were enormous. China is going to be number one, not just in uh, producing parts, spare parts for uh, 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 American products, but actually going to be leading in 5G, leading in artificial intelligence. And so now the, the United States is trying very hard to stop China. But my, my, my broad answer to uh, Sushan is that the Americans are trying to close the stable door after the horse has bolted. It's too late. China has taken off already. And if you squeeze them on chips and so on and so forth, you set them back three to four years, but no matter whatever the field is, China today will have the capacity to match uh, the United States. And, and ironically, it is the Trump administration that has accelerated Chinese investment uh, in R&D because the Chinese realize, hey, this is where the real gain is. So I, I predict that 10 years from now, uh, all the efforts made by the United States to block China in developing technology in various areas would have failed. And it would have, would have been seen as a big mistake by the United States to have actually accelerated the uh, Chinese push towards advanced technology. I have a question here from uh, Brooke, Brooke Du, who, uh, from mainland China. Um, it, so 
is the Sino-US conflict really about competition to become the number one economy of the world, or is it more rooted in ideological differences? So um, in the book, you talk about the US view of China as a communist party state and, um, and, and have some things to say about that. So what, what role does ideology play in this as opposed to simple um, economic primacy? Well, I mean, ideology is uh, definitely a, a factor in all this. And, um, and, and Americans believe that democracy is the best form of government. Americans also believe that communist party systems are uh, basically unjust because it's a dictatorship. People cannot choose their government and so on and so forth. So obviously it is, it is a factor. But at the end of the day, one mustn't forget that the number one ally of uh, United States at the end of the Cold War was China. Uh, and China, in fact, the United States courted China in 1971, when China had just come out of its cultural revolution and when Mao was still running China. And can you imagine how much better off China, Chinese people are today compared to 1971. And in 1971, uh, United States didn't complain to Mao and Zhou and Dai and say, you have a terrible system, please change it. They didn't say anything like that at all. Zero. Right? So it shows you that if it suits American interests, it can put ideology aside. But ideology is a good propaganda weapon to use against uh, China. So in my book, as you know, I say that Americans like to say all the time that China is a threat to democracies globally. So I, my, my response in the book is that if China is a threat to democracies globally, the three largest democracies in the world, and number one is India, number two is United States, number three is Indonesia. Out of the three largest ones, only United States sees the threat to its democracy. India doesn't see China a threat to its democracy. India sees China as a threat to Indian power and influence, but not to its democracy. Indonesia doesn't see China a threat to its democracy. Indonesia sees China as a challenge to deal with the neighborhood, but not a threat to its democracy. So clearly, when, when America brings up the ideological issue, it is mostly as a propaganda weapon to be used against China. Um. Very good. Could you say a little bit about the, we, we, we had a, a question about the internal politics of the Chinese Communist Party, um, which talks rather from Julian, who says any views on the power struggles within the Chinese political party, or the Chinese Communist Party. Um, I'm not quite sure what Julian is referring to, but at the very least, it would be interesting to hear your sense of the kind of internal stability of the Communist Party after COVID-19 and what you think Xi Jinping is trying to achieve. I mean, I presume that you think most people he's going to go on and take um, a third term. And in the book, you were quite, um, you know, not you didn't criticize him for having taken that step. Um, and so, yes, could you just say a little bit about the internal position of, of China's leadership and how that leads them to see the world? Mm. Well, if I pretended, <laughs> that I knew what was going on inside the Chinese Communist Party. I've been lying to all of you. Frankly, I don't believe anybody who tells me that he knows exactly what is going on inside the Chinese Communist Party, except possibly for the CIA. I mean, I, I would say the CIA, because it uh, signals intelligence is very, very good, the best in the world, they can probably pick up signals about what's happening better than anybody can. I think they, they probably have a good understanding. But I don't have an understanding, but I do know one big thing at least that before President Xi Jinping came to office, actually the Chinese Communist Party was facing two huge problems. One is that corruption was growing. And that actually, is, frankly, is quite natural because when your economy suddenly explodes, as it did in the 2000s, when your economy is explode, corruption, lots of money, corruption grows. And the second big problem was factionalism. And, and we now know that two of the most powerful figures in the Chinese Communist Party, uh, Bo Xilai and Zhou Yongkang, actually almost tried to mount a coup d'etat and take over the Chinese Communist Party. So, and, and 
the amazing thing about Xi Jinping is that he, he didn't have to fight one. He fought two big political monsters in the Chinese Communist Party and won. That's a big deal, by the way. You know? That's a really big deal. It shows that he's got some remarkable capabilities. And so he's accumulated all that power. And so, frankly, uh, when everybody in the world criticized him for removing the term limits, it was in some ways a very logical, rational thing uh, for him to do. Because if, if China today is facing its biggest geopolitical challenge ever in having to deal with the United States, it makes perfect sense for, the, for China to have a safe pair of hands to remain in charge. And by the way, in most countries in the world, there are no term limits. And the reason why Singapore did so well uh, under Lee Kuan Yew, Bo King Sui and Rajaratnam in the early years, because there were, no, there were no term limits. And it's good that there are no term limits because they carried Singapore up to a very high level in one generation. And if Xi Jinping accomplishes that, he would have lifted up China dramatically to a much higher level then he can leave office. Very good. So we've just gone through eight o'clock. I said right at the beginning that we were going to run a few minutes over. Kishore has said that, that he can stay. So let me ask one final question from the audience. We haven't got to every question, but I've tried to get through as many as I can. And then I'll, Mark also has a question and, and he'll, he'll wrap up. So um, this is a, a question from Sharmishta, uh, who's joining us from uh, Geneva, um, working at the World Economic Forum. Um, and, and so the question is about cooperation, and I thought this would be a nice point to, to end it on. So we talk an awful lot about US-China competition, the slide into a Cold War, even over recent weeks, people have begun talking about the prospect of a hot war. Um, but Charmista asks, um, what is the role of the world's leading powers in redefining international cooperation, um, which I take to mean, you know, what hope that the US and China actually can cooperate in future on some of the big challenges of our time, whether it's COVID or climate change um, or many other things besides. So do you, do you see much hope for a, a future of superpower competition and cooperation or, or in a sense, are we leaving that world behind us? Well, as you know, uh, James, since you read my book, uh, on the very last page of the book, uh, I say that if the US and China keep fighting each other when they're pressing global challenges like global warming. I, didn't, I wrote my book before COVID-19, obviously. Like global warming, future historians will see them as two tribes of apes fighting each other while the forest around them was burning. And that's not a very intelligent thing to do. And frankly, if, the, if, the, if China had a rational government, and I think to be fair, China has a rational government, and if the United States has an equally rational government, what the two countries should be doing today actually is cooperating more than competing because the common challenges they face are much greater than their bilateral uh, differences. I mean, I spoke about global warming, but frankly, in, when it comes to COVID-19, and today when you look at how badly off the world economy is, I can tell you the best way to jumpstart the, the global economy is for President Trump to unilaterally announce and say, from now on, all, all my trade war with China is over, all tariffs are lifted, and we will go back to where we were. I assure you, the stock markets will rise dramatically if the world hears, wow, US and China are gonna come together to fix the global economy. Can you imagine what a, what a wonderful thing it will be for them? For the world, it's so simple, so sensible, but it's, it's, there's a shocking thing about the, the world we live in. Something so simple and sensible cannot be done. Unless, of course, they read my book. <laughs> well, that's a good note, to, uh, good note to end on. You can see it on the screen. Let me, uh, let me hand over to Mark because he has a question about the book itself. Yes. Um, uh, but anyway, thank you very much for me. And Mark, why don't you take over from here? Yes. Yeah, thanks so much, James. I, uh, Kishore, we want to get you uh, off this call and, and to dinner so that you can take your call on India. Uh, but I do want to say that you've defended yourself extremely well uh, from, from a very capable James Crabtree, um, you know, putting you through the, through the fires, uh, as well as, um, I think, fielding some great questions from the audience. So we, we, I was very uh, excited to see, and I'm, I'm, I apologize that we don't 
have the, the time to get through all the questions that people, people posted to the Q&A. Um, but I do want to encourage everyone. Um, I've read the book. I think it's a, it's a phenomenal, like, I, um, like Kishore says, it, it's in the 1% in terms of a sort of a defense of, of China. And it's a, it's a different perspective than I'm used to. And, and I, was, I was very uh, grateful for, for a refreshing perspective. Uh, and Kishore, if I could ask you just as a closing remarks, were you to be given the chance to, to write an addendum to the book or, or to close it out today, uh, given the events of the past five, six months, both COVID and Hong Kong, um, particularly with regards to Hong Kong and how that situation is being perceived in the Western media. Uh, I just wonder, you know, what, what, uh, what you might add or, or subtract or, or uh, you know, do differently. Well, I think definitely uh, COVID-19 has actually re reinforced the thesis of my book, Mark, because there is, you know, I conclude the book by saying, there are actually more reasons for the United States and China, if they want to take care of their own people, to cooperate with each other rather than to go and try and kill each other. And so COVID-19 has reinforced uh, that argument. And, and that's why paradoxically, even though uh, COVID-19 was the worst possible time for me to launch the book because I couldn't travel anywhere. <laughs> I haven't done a single uh, book event, you know, except for uh, web events like this. But at the same time, I think COVID-19 has reinforced the uh, argument about, about my book. But in the case of Hong Kong, of course, I, I would say the, the Western strategy towards Hong Kong is another illustration of the lack of long-term strategic thinking. Because the, the very, there's a very simple question, if I was a, a Western leader, is it in, in Western long-term interests to destroy Hong Kong, so then you damage China? Or is it in Western long-term interest to keep Hong Kong going as long as possible as a kind of a halfway stop for the West to engage China? And then we can use Hong Kong to benefit from the world's largest market that is emerging in China, right? And, and if I was a rational Western leader, I would say, yeah, I should, I should try and keep Hong Kong going as long as possible. But you know, when, 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 when Western leaders complain about the uh, national security law, the national security law was actually part of, is in Article 23. Hong Kong was supposed to do it. It's not, it's, it, there, there's nobody's changing the goalposts. It's, it's there, it's, it's written down very clearly. It's supposed to be done and the Hong Kong couldn't do it. So, okay, the national government does it and it has the authority to do so. And every country has national security laws. And you can see that actually, you know, when everybody was complaining about how brutal the uh, Hong Kong police were in the riots and so on and so forth. But Ma, if you give me a choice, if I was in a demonstration and you asked me choose, do you want to, Hong Kong police force or a, a American city police force to come and deal with you, I would choose the Hong Kong police force any day. Yeah. They are British trained. They don't use weapons, right? They use tear gas, right? In the US, you get shot. So, Come on. I mean, so the, the, the Western media treatment of Hong Kong has been so jaundiced and so unfair. And, and at the end of the day, it doesn't serve Western interest. So yeah. I would say that if you, I, I, that's what I, my key message is think long term, think strategically, and then figure out what your real core interests are. And the core interests of the West are preserve Hong Kong, don't destroy it. Just wonderful. Thank you so much. Again, um, I think uh, everybody's going to give a, a big round of applause. Uh, it'll be a silent applause for you, but um, we'll know that people are doing that at home. Um, to both uh, James and to Kishore, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure from everybody. I'm seeing the comments come in. Um, everybody's very grateful. I cannot wait to welcome you here, Kishore, uh, and hopefully we'll get to do a sort of, yeah, we'll get to do an in-person uh, conversation, uh, and, and hopefully it won't be too too long. Um, again, thanks very much and wish everybody a wonderful night and we'll be out of COVID, out of, out of lockdown on Friday.
all the best, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye for now.